When I was a kid, I was on the show called Jerry's Place. The show has basically been erased from the public consciousness, so don't rack your brain if you can't remember it. I mean, we were we were working for a small Canadian studio, hoping to market the show to an American audience, but um, half of season one never even aired. <laughs> the show followed a fairly typical formula. There's a father and mother character, wise yet silly parents, who dispensed advice and hugs in equal parts. It was an older teenage sibling who was aloof and angsty, but also brought friends over to add color to the small cast, and two young siblings, one of them very young, the other of around nine or ten, who were there to make hijinks and generally move the story along. The latter was my niche. I was the middle child. That was usually responsible for comic relief or having some part in the problem of the week's story. The two adult characters were Linda and Mike, and they were actually pretty cool, too. See, Mike was a lifelong actor that always had a word of advice or a smile if you were feeling scared. As someone who grew up without a father, Mike was the person I used as a model for what a man should be, though it's probably become intertwined with his character on the show to a certain degree. Linda was great, too. A mom with kids of her own, who was always looking after us when we weren't shooting on set and making sure that we got enough to eat. My own mother was working two jobs to keep the lights on at home, so there were evenings when I would join Linda and her family for dinner until my mom could come and pick me up. Linda and Mike, they were almost like, like surrogate parents for me during those years of my life. And Rachel and Mark became almost like adopted siblings. Rachel was the older sister, angsty and above it all on camera, but she was always very nice off screen. Rachel would run lines with me when I was scared and always help me when I needed something. She was actually 19, though she played a 16-year-old. And on the nights when Linda couldn't take me, I'd hang out with Rachel until Mom came to pick me up. Mark, the younger brother, was six. We weren't too far off in age, really. I mean, we, we had similar interests. We would sit around between scenes, we'd talk about Ninja Turtles, or Power Rangers, play Game Boy together. In many ways... Those five people became family to me for that year and a half of my life. And that makes the rest of the story all the harder to tell. It was a typical day of shooting. We finished what would have been season one. We were shooting some scenes for season two. The network had been pleased with our viewership so far, so a second season seemed to be on the cards. With the second season, though, came a live studio audience. I mean, this was the 90s, and live studio audiences were all the rage. The first season had been live a few times for special episodes, but this season would have a live studio audience throughout. The presence of an audience was a bit distracting, and often led to Mark and I playing it up a little to get their attention. We had been asked to ignore them, but, but you know, we were young, and the laughter of adults meant a lot to us. We were on episode 6 of season 2 when they brought in a very different audience. I remember it perfectly. The event gouged into my mind, surgically. You know, we were setting up for the opening scene when the stage door opened, and a crowd of people filled in. There were about 20 of them. Our audiences tended to be slow, and I can remember not seeing any children or strollers as they filled into the dark rows of seats. Usually they brought the house lights up for this, allowing us to see the audience, but today the crowd sat in shadow. Mark whispered to me about it, saying that they looked a little creepy, all huddled up in the dark. I told him it was probably just something new the director was going to do to make us ignore them. We set up for the shot, and I felt myself looking out into the crowd out of the corner of my eye. It wasn't that dark out there, you know, not really, but the whole audience sat in a small sea of darkness that seemed to crowd around them. They didn't talk, didn't shuffle, they just... They just hunched there, and they waited for us to begin. We rolled the opening. Jerry's Place is filmed before a live studio audience. And we began. As Mike came on stage, the titular Jerry, I had expected the crowd to clap as they usually did when a character came on scene. They didn't, though. They just sat there and they waited. The director looked back at them, but shrugged and whispered something to his assistant. Mike looked out at the audience strangely too, but he was a pro and he didn't let it mess him up. 
Linda and Rachel, Megan and Bonnie, on the show, were watching TV as Mike walked in from the kitchen and delivered his lines. They cued Mark and I to run downstairs and begin the show's problem, a broken toy that was important to me. By the end of the show, Mark would have saved enough money to buy me a new one, and I would learn a valuable lesson about sharing, and everyone at home would feel warm and fuzzy as my brother and I hugged it out. At least, that's how it should have gone. I came downstairs yelling about my toy, a model airplane, and Mark was right behind me in his typical little brother fashion. Mike looked at the plane and asked if I couldn't just use it like this. I hit my mark and I prepared to deliver my character's catchphrase. My catchphrases were prominent in the 90s. They were also very marketable, and my catchphrase was supposed to elicit laughs from the audience. Until then, they had just been sitting quietly. I wish they'd stayed quiet. Play with a broken toy? That's gonna be a deal breaker for me, Pops! I said, looking at the audience as I did so. That's when they started to laugh. I expected a chuckle, maybe even full-fledged laugh or two. But the audience emitted that hearty, candid laughter that you hear in sitcoms, when a real audience might be too much. Mike started to give his next line, but the audience just kept laughing. I looked at them, my face still holding that mischievous smile that it always did after my catchphrase, and saw that the shadowy crowd was laughing and heaving in unison. The shadowy mob was hitching and chuckling as one being, and I... As I watched, I felt my smile faltering. Mike tried to give his next line again, but the laughter overtopped him. The director said something to his assistant, and the man brought out cardboard cards that read, Quiet, please. He held them high, right in front of the audience, but the audience just kept laughing. Their laughter had begun to sound sick. The longer they laughed, the more painful and crazed it began to sound. Someone in the crowd was clearly choking, but they continued to laugh through it. The laughter never rose or fell in volume, just the mad, candid laughter I would become so familiar with later in life. It was emotionless and inhuman, and it just continued to pour out of them as they sat huddled in the shadows. The assistant shouted at the crowd then. The director called for the cameras to be cut. One of the cameramen, I, I can't remember his name, but he, he was always kind of a joker, turned his camera to film the crowd. Maybe he thought it would be great for a gag reel or something, or perhaps... He thought the studio was playing a joke on us, but whatever he was thinking, he had an excellent seat for what happened next. When the assistant's shouts failed to gain their attention, he walked into the seats and started yelling at the crowd. That's when his angry shouts turned into underwhelmed laughs, and he too started chuckling. The director turned and started shouting at the crowd to be quiet, even as he shouted at his assistant to come down. By this point, we had all started milling about close to our marks so we could start again. I couldn't help but notice Rachel and Linda on the couch and how Linda had a protective arm around Rachel. They looked scared, and despite being trained to stay close to our marks, I went over and sat with them, waiting to be in on the protective bubble. A stagehand had gone into the audience to get the assistant back, but now he was sitting and chuckling right along with the rest. It was the same candid laughter, but it sounded like like lunatics now. They were constantly unchanging in pitch or fervor, and it was all becoming too spooky for me. Mark came to sit beside me as well, and I wrapped a brotherly arm around him just as Linda had. I don't like this, Mark cried as big tears ran down his cheeks. They're scaring me. I told him that I was pretty scared too, and when Mike came up and put his hand on the back of the couch... I felt safe knowing he was there. As we sat, another stagehand went up. He grasped the first by the arm, pulling him and trying to get him to leave, but soon he too was laughing and grinning as he took a seat next to him. The director forbade anyone else to go up after that. The crew sat huddled together on the edge of the set as they tried to figure out what was happening. There seemed to be a barrier between them and us. None of them came into our little circle of protection on the couch, and none of us felt the need to go to them. The director sent a stagehand to get security after the third member of the crew joined them. The stagehand found the doors to be locked, and none of his keys would open them. He came back white-faced, skirting the audience seats, as though whatever they had might be airborne. The director sent someone to see if the roof access was open, but they discovered the same thing. Keys didn't work, and the hatch was locked. Someone tried a landline in the back, but found no dial tone. 
This was before cell phones became the norm, but the director had a bag phone that he tried. Same thing. No dial tone and no calls would go out. And all the while, they laughed. After an hour, they were still laughing. The director and some of the crew had broken their distance and came to sit around the couch. They had brought items from the food service table over and we all just kind of had a picnic. I mean, it would have been nice had the creepy laughing shadow people not been staring at us the whole time. As we ate, I noticed that some of the crew had stayed away and seemed to be eating on the set's outskirts. They kept looking at the crowd. And some of them were staring. And when I asked the director about them, he shook his head. One of them claims that their father is sitting in the audience. What? Mike asked, his mouth full of sandwich. He says that the man in the front row near the middle is his father. Says it can't be him because he died of lung cancer last year. But that definitely looks like him. He says that every now and again, the laughing man will look at him. Try to wave him over. He knows he shouldn't go, but he says that every time the guy waves him over, it's hard not to go. That's nuts! Linda breathed. Each of them has a story like that, the director says. For Carrie? He pointed to the redhead with a ponytail. It's your girlfriend who left for New Mexico and never came back. For Steve, he pointed to a man with a salt and pepper crew cut, it's his sister who stopped talking to him after his parents left him everything in their will. They all have someone, and all of them think they might. But as he spoke, he saw Carrie get up and take a step towards the chuckling crowd. One of the others grabbed her, but she shrugged him off and walked towards the crowd like someone in a dream. She embraced one of the shadow masses and then sat next to them, chuckling and smiling, as his butt pressed the seat. After Steve left too, the director decided to take action. He told one of the hands near us to turn up the house lights. He wanted lights on the crowd so he could see who they were. Maybe they would stop laughing if their cover was blown, and this could all be over and we could all go back to work. He still seemed to think that this might be a prank, though not a very funny one, and wanted an end to it already. Some of the stagehands went to get things set up, but we all kept looking at that quietly chuckling behemoth. Mark had fallen asleep somehow, and I kept my arm wrapped around him, as though I might stand between him and the tide, should they change. I was still munching absentmindedly at fruit from the food table, and I didn't notice Rachel getting up until my bowl of honeydew almost tipped over. Linda grabbed her wrist, anchoring her to the couch, but when I looked up, I could see that her eyes were big and starry. Her blonde ponytail bobbed a little as she scanned the crowd, and Linda started asking her what she was looking for. I thought I saw someone up there. Someone I haven't seen in very long. But she gasped harshly, then, It's him! Oh my god, it's him! She was pulling against Linda's hand, but Linda refused to let go. Who, Rach? Who is it? Linda asked, trying to restrain the girl as Mike moved to help. It's my dad! My dad's up there! He... He looks like he did in the photo my mom has on her dresser. He hasn't changed a bit. I looked at the crowd, trying to see who she was looking at, but failing. Rach, your dad died before you were born. Your mother told me about his accident. It can't be him. But it is! Rach almost screamed, pitching her body from side to side as she tried to break free. Mike and Linda held her tightly, and I scooted closer to Mark so Mike could sit on the couch. The two of them sat there and held her as she sobbed for them to let her go. She used a lot of swear words as she thrashed about, but they refused to let her go. When she finally stopped, she sat crying into Linda's shoulder as the two of them hugged her tightly. Someone yelled down from the catwalk then, and the stage was suddenly awash with light. The overheads were unbearably bright, and as they all lit at once, I remember tinting my eyes with my hands so they didn't blind me. We had used them for beach scenes a few times when the rain caused us to not shoot in location, and I can remember thinking they were always so much brighter than the real sun. They lit up every corner of the set, but as I squinted at the seats, I realized I'd been wrong. Every corner but that one, it seemed. The seats were still a pool of shadows, but when the light hit them, everything changed. The low chuckling became a strange hybrid of screaming and deep booming laughter. 
The kind of laughter that you heard in an insane asylum. The kind of laughter you heard in hell. The people in the seats never moved. But the darkness did. It plumed out like a fog and started rolling towards us. Those sitting near the seats were hit. We could hear their laughter starting as they fell to their knees and clutched their stomachs. The director shouted at the crew to kill the lights, but it was much too late. The darkness was angry now, and it was no longer satisfied with the few people that it had in the seats. It was coming for us. Mike grabbed Mark and me and lifted us both up with his strong arms and started running backstage. He turned to yell for Linda, but she was fighting with Rach as the girl tried to free herself again. She was straining towards the fog and it was creeping in to get both of them. Mike yelled for her to let Rachel go if she wasn't going to come, but Linda refused. She refused to leave her there. She strained and pulled at the girl, but Rachel was apparently stronger than she looked. It didn't matter a moment later as the fog rolled in and they were both little more than chuckling shadows. Mike ran to the back, Mark crying and asking him what was going on. He had woken up when Mike picked him up, and Mike was looking frantically for some way to escape. He saw a window and lifted a piece of wood to smash against it. As he brought the wood down, however, he might as well have been hitting concrete, because the board bounced off, splinters flying. The dark fog was rolling past the set walls now, and Mike was almost out of options. Mark and I just stood against a wall, eyes roving around like scared dogs, trying to make sense of what was happening. Finally, Mike settled on a closet. He was full of brooms and mops, but we didn't have time to move them by that point. Mike pushed us in and, and sighed as he saw how much room we took up. As the fog plume passed him, he slammed the door and left us in total darkness. His laughter started a few seconds later, and the sound nearly drove us mad as we huddled in the tiny closet. Mark and I hunched arms wrapped around each other, expecting that we would both begin to laugh at any moment. We sat like that for a long time, I had no idea how long until we both must have fallen asleep to the sound of Mike's choked laughter. When I woke up, I was in a hospital. My mother was asleep in the chair next to my bed. I got the whole story a few days later. My mother didn't know much. She'd come to the set only to find all the doors locked and the police trying to get in. Once I'd gotten in, some of them started laughing and they, they couldn't stop. The paramedics and the fire department had come. After searching the place with breathing equipment, they found Mark and I and they brought us to safety. I mean, there was nothing wrong with either of us, not physically, but the two of us had been, had been catatonic for nearly three days. The man from the studio, the one in the pristine suit and the oiled hair, he had told me a different story. He said that there had been some kind of gas leak, claimed that most of those present had been hallucinating due to gas. The audience, the cast, the crew, they'd all died due to the gas inhalation, and Mark and I, we'd been lucky to survive. Our parents would both sign non-disclosure agreements. We'd promise not to talk about anything we'd seen, and in exchange, we'd receive a large amount of financial compensation. My mother and I needed the money now that the show was going to be cancelled. Both our parents signed, and Mark and I went our separate ways. The whole event was deemed a tragic accident, and I never worked in showbiz again. And that would be the end of the story, if it weren't for the email I received a week ago. I'm in my 30s now, and about a week ago I got a Facebook request from Mark. I'd expected that he'd want to catch up, have a beer, share some old stories. But his first message was far from what I expected. He sent me a messenger request a few seconds later. He only sent me seven words. Are they still laughing for you too? We met up for that beer the next day. Mark was older, but far from doing well. The guy looked rough, borderline homeless. Seemed eternally looking around to see who was near him. He asked if I still heard the laughter. Told him I hadn't. Not since that day all those years ago. He said that for him, it never stopped. He'd wake up to see shadowy figures at the end of his bed, had candid laughter bubbling from their dark lips. He said Rachel and Linda and Mark were right out front, 
two white teeth smiling as they laughed and laughed. His parents hadn't believed him. They thought it was just a bad dream because of the incident. The drugs the shrinks gave him just meant he was a drooling zombie as the laughing apparitions chuckled on and on. He started using when he was young. It was alcohol at first. His dad had a cabinet in the living room, then drugs. When he was in high school, he stole prescription drugs, used blends of different drugs, drank himself into oblivion, but nothing helped. Every night, they were waiting for him, and every night, he screamed until they disappeared with the light of day or the arrival of someone else. I just wanted to see if you'd found a way to make them stop too, big brother, he said sadly as he left the bar. He killed himself a week later. Put a gun in his mouth and... And the rest is pretty easy to figure out. I envy him, though. Envy that he had the strength to do what was needed to be done. About a week ago, I woke up to the sound of that candid laughter that always creeped me out in the sitcoms. I fumbled for the remote, thinking I'd just left the TV on, but as the TV came to life, I saw them. They were arrayed at the foot of my bed, their bodies made of living darkness, made all the murkier by the light of the TV, and their laughter went on and on. Mark was among them. His unkempt hair, now a raven mane of living darkness. Mike was there too. And Linda. And Rachel, all of them, laughing and laughing and laughing as I lay in bed, frozen in terror. They left with the sun. And I got up to write this. I don't know how long I can take this. I'm afraid to go to sleep, afraid to see them. But I'm too afraid to take Mark's way out either. I mean, I see him amongst them, laughing and laughing like an audience in hell, and I wonder if I'll join them too in the end. I'm afraid to go to sleep. I'm afraid to be awake. I'm afraid to see their faces, and I'm afraid of running into them again. My eyes are getting heavy. Fourth cup of coffee jittering in my hands. I wonder if it hurts to laugh forever. Perhaps I'll find out. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to wish you a very well, we're getting close to October. <laughs> Are you as excited as I am? Also, thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast, if you're listening on Spotify. The summer is finally coming to an end, and that means we're moving into the fall. And as we get further into the fall, for those of you that live in cooler climates, you'll probably like to have a nice cup of tea. To get a nice cup of tea, my wife sells it. It's at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. You can get a whole bunch of different teas there, including creepy pasta based teas. My personal favorite is the Dark and Stormy Night, which is why you can get a sticker of me on it. And if you do buy that one, you can always ask for that sticker of me doing the little dab. And you get a special dab sticker. Also, I want to give a very big thank you to all of my Patreons over there on Patreon, because you guys have helped me out quite a bit. Like, not, I get, I'm not even quite a bit. You guys are like, honestly, you guys pulled me out of an incredibly dark place when I first had to look at moving and all of the demon stuff that YouTube does. And thank you guys very dearly for all the help that you've given me. People like Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arce, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Raven Mitz, Satanic Aries, Ness69420, also Dotrade, Payne, Nessie, Blitzkrieg, Bardo Hawk764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Madam Skullbunny, Sashi Sazaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, 
Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Fay Lockett, Miss Xander, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Suji Campbell, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Once again, thank you all so much to everyone who is in this list of names that I mispronounce, and everyone who's in the description, and everyone who supports me at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I can't thank you guys enough for listening, for watching, and I wish you all sweet dreams. Good night, everyone.